Okay, Grant, can you put up the, uh, the screen? And we'll wait to fifty eight to start the uh, webinar. So my son lives in Lethbridge. It was plus 18 in Lethbridge today, which is just ridiculous for December 1st, but oh well. Okay, folks, it's uh, 5.58. I'm going to start the webinar and go to radio silence. So here we go. Again, about uh, 6.01, we will uh, start you up. Are we on? Not quite yet, just hold on. Oh, sorry. I wanna make sure. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Western Canadian History Lecture Series for 2021 with Dr. Andrew Wolford. My name is Florence Glanfield, and I am honored to serve as the Vice Provost Indigenous Programming and Research at the University of Alberta. I'm a member of the, Nor of the Métis Nation of Alberta, born and raised in Northeastern Alberta, and my background is from the Athabasca River Delta. I want to first of all acknowledge that the University of Alberta, its buildings, labs, and research stations are primarily located on the traditional territory of Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe nations. Lands that are now known as part of treaties six, seven, and eight 
and homeland of the Métis. The University of Alberta respects the sovereignty, lands, histories, languages, knowledge systems, and cultures of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations. We also want to acknowledge and remember the children who were forcibly taken from their families, those are to go to residential school, those children who are still with us today, those children who did not return home from the schools, and those who have since passed. I wanna start with a word of gratitude. I wanna start with gratitude, first of all, to Elder Cardinal, who is joining us this evening, to Dr. Andrew Wolford, our speaker, the department chair of history, classics and religion, Dr. Ryan Dunch, faculty members who co-organized co this event, Shannon Stundenbauer and Crystal Fraser, and the graduate students who supported this work, Dylan Hall and Chris Chang-Yen Phillips, and finally, to all of the technical support team in the Faculty of Arts. This evening, the, his, the lecture is titled, With Intent to Destroy a Group, Genocides Past and Present in Canada. And we will, the, fall, the event will unfold in the following ways. First of all, Elder Cardinal will lead us in a ceremony. Then the department chair, Ryan Dunch, will introduce Dr. Wolford. Dr. Wolford will then speak for about 45 minutes. There will then be a question and answer period moderated by the co-organizers, Shannon Stundenbauer and Crystal Fraser. And then there'll be a closing and an expression of gratitude by the department chair. So I'm honored to introduce all of you to a dear friend and elder Gilman Cardinal, a full status Big Stone Cree Treaty, Treaty 8 Nation member who was raised in Calling Lake along with six brothers and six sisters. The community members lived a traditional communal lifestyle and welfare was totally unheard of. Hunters provided the food, medicine men and women were the healers, midwives delivered the babies and women, and women led the households. In his early 20s, Gilman's parents advised him to leave the community and seek a career in the outside world. Gilman was employed with the Alberta Provincial Government for over 40 years and retiring June 2008. He delivered a wide range of programs and services, mostly for Indigenous peoples. These included some of the following, labor market programs and services, trades and apprenticeships, a relocation program for Indigenous families moving to urban centers to access better economic opportunities and managing provincial and Indigenous job corps. He is a proud grandpa with eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, Chapans. He might, you might be able to call him Musham or Musum, depending on whether or not you're speaking Bush Cree or Plains Cree. Elder Cardinal is following his eldership path and is pleased to provide the smudge and blessing for our event today. Gilman, we are honored to have you with us today. Hi, hi. Hi, hi, Florence, my good friend. <clears throat> thank you for uh, your introduction and thank you all of you for having me today. And now I wanna start by thanking Crystal Fraser for asking, reaching out and asking me to come today and, and be with you <clears throat> and support you to, tonight. And I wanna start by uh, again, Thanking you, Crystal, for the protocol. As you are aware, all of you collectively in our Indigenous way, this is a contract. Unlike the Western way I was a part of for 40 years, 
what does a Western contract look like? Three, three copies, time frames, deliverables, all those good things, right? This in our indigenous way is the same thing. It's a beautiful culture. And uh, I'm very honored to be here today. I too as well acknowledge the territory we're in, Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton and uh, Treaty 7 in the south and Treaty 8 where I'm from in the north and a collective of 11 peace treaties. I also acknowledge the Métis, one of the largest growing population, indigenous population in Canada. And of course our Inuit, Inuit peoples as well, and their beautiful culture. I want to honor as well, and by way of doing that by my smudge, I feel it's, it's very important we do this ceremony in the most sacred way, given the topic. And I've already cleansed the room where I'm going to be speaking and praying. And I'll, I'll stand, send the message and the prayers. This is medicine going your way as the speaker is presenting to, to help you lift up your spirit as you speak on such a sacred topic that affects so many of us today. I myself, I'm a second generation residential school victim. Mom and dad were both in residential school. And uh, I was nine years old when the planes landed in my community and took most of our kids. So I know the story, the real story. I do a lot of ceremony and training. And one of the things I always explain to people make mention to people is that this wasn't very long ago, the last residential school closed 25 years ago, and it affects up to seven generations of peoples. And I was there when it happened. And we need to do that as elders, as we're healing. We need to share the real stories. And I'm so honored to be here today with you and to listen to the speaker who will enlighten us and uh, share the real truths of how much it has affected us in so many different ways. I too, like Florence, honor and respect the little ones that haven't made it home yet. And the ones that are waiting still, the mothers, the fathers, the aunts, the uncles, the kokums, the musums, all the relatives that are still waiting and haven't made it home. I'm going to do my prayer in the Western way, also in my indigenous way. That's how I pray. And when I pray, there's often a misunderstanding. I use the eagle feather. This is what we gift our role models. And I do that quite often. So we always start East. And this is the Cree way. My Blackfoot brothers and others, the Métis and Inuit, also pray in their own way. Their, their presentation varies, but inside, collectively, it's always the same, right? It's always the same. So I start East, the color red, the beginning of life. That's the child, and that's indigenous. First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. And then I go South together with the smudge. And that's the color yellow. That's, that's that represents the youth, our Asian brothers and sisters. Then I go west, blue, quite often black, our Afro-American brothers, peoples of color. And finally, <clears throat> like my hair, white. And that's what I call the circle of life. That's how I pray. That's how we pray in our indigenous way. I'm going to pray in my indigenous way. In Nanasco Monumentumno, I know Skisago get thou hiak, Matsuent of Mortiak, Kimama Noaski, and so we tinoma, Kamam Kamam Scotamik, Atigon Maima, Kamam Scotamik, Awasa Kagut Nito, Nasco Mau Crystal, Emit, O get thou hit steamawa. Pisito Scatago. Nascomal Florence, Florence, my good friend. 
O kaki o men kau yesta e goma. All of you that put this together, I honor you. Kaki o nas kom nao. Kaki o nas kom ao kapi hoto. O as segats ko kapi giwito. Kunig min sa wimao. Kaki o kso imp no no. Kaki o kwa mi o pai. Hi hi. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Gilman. And now colleagues, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ryan Dunch to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Provost Glanfield. And thank you so much, Elder Cardinal, for, uh, for that uh, blessing. Welcome on behalf of the Department of History, Classics and Religion to the annual endowed lecture in Western Canadian history, which is an important event in our department. Uh, it reflects the long-standing importance that understanding the history of this part of the world has held in the teaching and research conducted in our department, going right back to the founding of the university in 1908. It also reflects our shared commitment to contributing to public and expert understanding of the ongoing operation of settler colonialism in what is now Canada, now known as Canada. Indian residential schools were, of course, a key element in this. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome Professor Andrew Wolford uh, to speak to us tonight, today. Uh, Professor Wolford is Professor of Sociology and Criminology, and he is a member of the University of Manitoba Faculty Association a member of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars, and he is former president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. So he's eminently qualified to speak to us on the topic today. Uh, he's also the author of uh, a book and the co-editor of several books and, of course, many articles, uh, including uh, his book, This Benevolent Experiment, Indigenous Boarding Schools, Genocide and Redress in the United States and Canada, which was published in 2015. He's co-editor of Did You See Us? Reunion, Remembrance and Reclamation at an Urban Indian Residential School in 2021, Canada and Colonial Genocide in 2017, and Colonial Genocide in Indigenous North America in 2014. His current work is on com two community-based research projects with residential school survivors. Uh, he has most recently initiated a project on human and more than human relations within genocidal processes under the title Symbiogenetic Destruction. Now, given our speaker's place of employment, it's important to note that we as members of the Association of Academic Staff at the University of Alberta stand in solidarity with the academic staff at the University of Manitoba, who are currently going into week five, I believe, of a strike. Uh, today's event is by no means a break in this solidarity. We're going ahead in a manner consistent with the provisions put in place by the University of Manitoba Faculty Association. Now, at this point, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, while I uh, offer the next uh, few words, uh, please be warned that the following presentation deals with difficult material. Indian residential schools were profoundly abusive institutions that subjected students to physical, emotional and sexual abuse, as well as scientific and medical experimentation. Students themselves, their families and descendants and entire communities were harmed. Hearing about these harms may be particularly difficult for individuals with personal or community connections to these events, for individuals who have experienced other abusive situations, and for those who are particularly vulnerable to the ongoing operation of settler colonialism and white supremacy. If you encounter difficulties, in response to today's events. Uh, we've got some numbers here on screen of Edmonton-based and university-based uh, resources. 
But nationally, you, there's also the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line, uh, which you will see on your screen. Uh, if, if you're in the presentation, of course, you won't be seeing the screen, but you can text or you can put in the chat to any of the organizers and we can send these phone numbers to you uh, through the chat function or by email if you have our emails. Uh, there's a text line, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, which also has a toll-free line, and uh, mental re health resources in the area where you're watching from. And uh, some good advice here that uh, is I want to thank Crystal Fraser for supplying these slides, but look after yourself, take a walk, call or text a friend, nourish your body with a snack, uh, express your emotions. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share. Uh, one further sort of um, prefatory thing that I need to say uh, is that sexual violence is much in our minds these days. Uh, for all sorts of important reasons. We know that we have work to do to ensure that we are providing a respectful, professional, and non-sexualized learning and work environment for students, faculty, and staff in our department and across the University of Alberta. The members of our department and myself personally are committed to doing that work. So with all those things uh, expressed, I'd like to turn it over to our guest for this evening uh, and please welcome, I know we can't really clap, but I'll, I'll clap, Professor Andrew Wolford. Thank you, Andrew. Right, thank you so much, Ryan, for the uh, wonderful introduction and the statement of solidarity. Uh, we're feeling solidarity towards you in Alberta as well with all your uh, struggling with at, at your university. Um, special thanks also to Elder Cardinal for starting us off in a good way. I was imagining myself uh, cleansing with that smudge before going into this, um, this, this, this hard topic that I'm going to talk about today. I also want to offer my thanks to the entire Department of History, Classics and Religion for inviting me to deliver this evening's lecture. It's, a, it's really a big honor. And also, you know, especially to Professor Shannon Stundenbauer, Crystal Fraser, and Crystal Raven for introducing um, the events that I've been part of this week. It's so far, it's been great, and I'm hoping it'll continue to be so. Um, I'm happy to, to be broadcasting to you from Treaty One land in the territories of the Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, Dayote, Dakota Ayote, Denisaline, and Nahethawak people, as well as the homeland of the Red River Metis. There's a long story about how I arrived at this area of study, um, and I won't uh, go through the entirety of it now. For the sake of brev brevity, allow me to highlight a few key moments. During my PhD, I was conducting research on the British Columbia Treaty process. And at the time, I thought I was going to do research on reconciliation, justice, reparations, those sorts of things. But when I went to interview Indigenous leaders and elders, they would say to me, uh, first, I must tell you about the genocide. And this happened on more than one occasion where they would sit me down and explain to me the history of their nation, whether it was the you know, Squamish or Seychelles, Tawasin, and um, give me a sense of what had happened, what had come before. So this was really an introduction um, to me that truth comes before reconciliation. It also struck me because at the time I was a teaching assistant for a course on genocide studies. And in the course, there was no mention of Canadian indigenous peoples. And when I asked professors who were interested in the area of genocide studies about this, some of them suggested that indigenous peoples used genocide in a rhetorical or political fashion, but that wasn't my sense talking to um, the leaders and elders who took the time to speak with me. My sense was that they were trying to express to me how colonialism threatened the very existence of their nations. So I always wanted to address that more. And when I came to Manitoba, um, this investigation was enhanced by my friendship with a survivor, an elder, Theodore Fontaine, who passed away in May of 2021. Uh, Ted's memoir, which is the reason I reached out to him, is on residential schools, his residential school experience. It's called Broken Circle. I highly recommend it because it captures so eloquently what I saw as a key feature of genocide, the destruction of relationships. Another key moment rose for me when my father passed away in 2017. 
And I discovered in some of his papers information about my grandfather, about who I never met. I knew very little because he, he died before I was born. Um, but I learned that he was a so-called orphan taken from my great grandmother to the Bernardo's orphanage before being sent to Canada as one of the home children. Uh, he's the image in the middle who kind of looks a little bit like me. Um, though I'd definitely, I would never equate this experience with child removals in Canada because I see the latter as targeted towards the destruction of a people. But reading my great grandmother's letters as she sought the return of, of him or merely contact with him, uh, gave me some perspective of, of the, the, the horrors caused by this sort of social engineering that took place through children, um, not just in Canada, but in many places throughout the world. And everywhere I go, people tell me different stories about forms of schooling and um, you know, incarceration at schools that are meant to, were meant to transform them from who they are. So this talk is also, I should say, delivered in the shadow of the Canadian Historical Association's Canada Day Statement, which declared a broad consensus among historians about the applicability of genocide to Canadian settler colonialism and sparked responses from a smaller group of historians who claimed dissensus and disagreement. I've recently co-published with Sean Carlton, um, a recently new colleague, a new colleague of mine at the University of Manitoba, an article in the conversation to counter some of the claims made by the latter group. But I wanna take a slightly different approach today and complicate our discussion using what I'm gonna to refer to as a critical genocide studies lens. This means I'm gonna focus less on adjudicating the genocide question Instead, while fully acknowledging genocide in Canada, or I would usually say genocides, multiple genocides in Canada, I'll argue that we also have to interrogate this concept of genocide because I'm gonna suggest that there are certain settler colonial ideas that are baked into it, and it requires some critical work to try to unpack those and create more space for a better concept of genocide. Before I begin, um, there's a few points I must cover. The first concerns the interdisciplinary field of genocide studies. This area of study emerged through the foundational work of Raphael Lemkin. I expect many of you have heard of Lemkin. He's a Polish Jewish jurist who in 1943 gave us the genocide concept. His work combined historical, social scientific and legal scholarship to identify a new crime, the destruction of a group. And this is important. He's talking about the destruction of the groups as an of a group as an entity, not the destruction of a bunch of individuals. The destruction is of a group. And Lemkin found it perplexing that the law possessed tools to condemn the death of an individual, but nothing to protect the life of a group. Drawing on a romantic Herderian concept of national groups, Lemkin believed groups contribute to the global wealth of humanity through their diverse cultures, languages, and practices. Genocide studies as a field did not emerge immediately after Lemkin coined the term, nor even in the aftermath of the adoption and entry into force of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It was not until the 1980s and 1990s that substantial work that went beyond studies of the Holocaust began to appear in this field. In fact, the move toward a comparative approach was fraught. The field was drawn into the uniqueness debate where the question was asked, is it possible to compare any other event to the Holocaust? Too much time was waging these arguments. But one element of the debate that is worth noting for our talk today is that even those who believed comparison possible tended to defer to the Holocaust as the prototype example, as the prototypical example of genocide measuring other cases against it. As well, a great deal of ink was spilt during this period by scholars seeking to improve the definition of genocide beyond what they spewed as the limitations of the Genocide Convention. Nearly every scholar brought with them to the field a different definition of genocide, contributing to the contested nature of the concept. Critical genocide studies operates to break us free of some of these habits of the field. First, it's discontinued prototype-based definitions of genocide and incessant definitional debate. Second, it seeks to disrupt hierarchies of genocide, whereby there is what anthropologists Alexander Hinton describes as an established core of acceptable case studies. These he refers to as the Holocaust, Armenia, and Rwanda. Secondary case studies that are sometimes questioned by some scholars. Here he includes East Pakistan, Bangladesh, as well as settler colonial genocides. 
And finally, a group of peripheral or hidden cases, such as in Burundi or Indonesia's slaughter of left-wing opponents. Critical genocide studies ask why some cases are more likely to come to the fore than others, as well as why some definitions of genocide rise, rise to prominence. Third, critical genocide studies avoids overly broadly overly broad comparative work that tends to examine case studies largely at the national level. In contrast, fine-grained analysis of local, regional, and global conditions of genocide are preferred, with attention given to the micro, meso, and macro processes of genocidal violence, as well as efforts to regulate, prevent, and ameliorate this violence. And fourth, critical genocide scholars have questioned the genocide concept in several ways. Some, like historian, Dirk Moses, and Dirk Moses, whose book you see here on the screen, in his recent book, The Problems of Genocide, look at how genocide law has extended rather than limited sovereign power. Moses argues that it allows nations to define what counts as transgression and thereby to use laws to accuse their enemies of genocide, shoring up their desires for permanent, what he calls permanent security. Other critical genocide scholars examine how genocide, the genocide keyword has been defined in a manner that privileges the lives of certain types of groups over others, and how this is often done with a Western bias. And that's this, today's lecture will follow that approach to look at some of these Western biases that are built into the genocide concept. Or I should say maybe Eurocentric biases. The pushback against the Canadian Historical Association's Canada Day statement is an echo of an earlier era of genocide scholarship, when scholars competed to be gatekeepers to the genocide concept. Gatekeepers, in my definition, often permit only the most rigid and particular applications, restricting the notion from developing and adapting to diverse destructive, destructive contexts. Such efforts begin analysis from a circum circumscribed, frozen, and sanctified understanding of genocide, rather than with the experiences of group members and how they live certain actions as a form of attempted destruction. So, you know, little effort in, is made here to try to understand what, are, what was the particular life of that group like? What were the elements of their life that brought them together as a group that made being part of a group valuable? Instead, it tries to fit everyone into a cookie cutter model of genocide where they have to adapt their experience to try to fit this interpretive grid that's been established. So, Let's start out by looking at some of the, the origins of the genocide concept. I'm gonna focus on three key works, uh, Lemkin's book, Access Rule in Occupied Europe, um, the working papers for the Genocide Convention, the transcripts of the debates of the General Assembly over, the, over, over the, the law of genocide, as well as Lemkin's autobiography. 1943, as I said, Lemkin coined the term genocide, publishing it in his, his definition in this book, Access Rule in Occupied Europe in 1944. That definition reads as follow. I'm not gonna go through this whole definition, but the bolded part, um, actually starting with coordinated, is genocide is a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups. So you can see the whole network of relation that Lemkin's targeting his concept at. He's not just talking about mass murder, he's talking about the ways in which uh, genocide seeks to target these various aspects of group life, of social life. It's also the case that Lemkin connected genocide to colonialism in, in, Axis, in Axis rule. He writes, genocide has two phases, one destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group, the other the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. This imposition in turn may be made upon the oppressed population, which is allowed to remain, or upon the territory alone after removal of the population and the colonization by the oppressor's own nationals. So he saw genocide as a process whereby um, either people were being removed through extermination or through forced removal, or they were simply being forcibly and rapidly assimilated into the new, uh, new world of the oppressor. Um, now, Mix Lemkin sound like he is really an anti-colonial innovator in some ways, but we have to grapple with the complexity of Lemkin's biography. We often celebrate Lemkin for his tireless efforts in the aftermath of the Holocaust to ensure creation of the United Nations Genocide Convention 
and we applaud how Lemkin staunchly defended inclusion of cultural genocide as a distinct type of group destruction, or as a, sorry, not type, but technique of group destruction, and did so against opposition from settler colonial states. For this reason, his legacy is often counterposed against those who limit genocide to its physical and biological forms. However, Lemkin also appears to have shifted his concept toward an emphasis on physical annihilation as time went on. Lemkin's commitment to legal codification of genocide through um, you know, ratification through the UN uh, was so great that he saw the need to compromise with powerful nations that were reluctant to embrace limitations on their powers. For this reason, Lemkin accepted the exclusion of political groups from the list of potential targets of genocide. Likewise, he sought to appease the United States by opposing use of this term, of his term, by the 1951 petition, We Charge Genocide, which was prepared by William Patterson in the Civil Rights Congress. The petition argued in great detail that the United States treatment of African-Americans met the criteria of the Genocide Convention, and they worked very specifically with Lemkin's thinking to try to show this. But Lemkin dismissed their arguments because he did not want them to distract from the US ratifying the Genocide Convention. Debate about Lemkin's legacy continues. His complexity is a reminder not to seek pure foundations for the genocide concept, as well as not to assume that genocide is necessarily or solely a law to protect the weak. Here again, Moses's book is very uh, illustrative in showing how genocide is politically used by uh, nation states, used politically by nation states. So in my view, unsettling genocide requires a critical genocide studies that does not shy from interrogation of the concept's origins. So looking further at those origins, we can look at the origins of the law and particularly the United Nations Genocide Convention. And in doing so, I wanna focus a lot on the debates around cultural genocide that occurred in the creation of the United Nations Genocide Convention. Since they reveal how settler colonial nations felt exposed for their historical and contemporary practices of indigenous erasure and dispossession. After the International Military Tribunal, where Lemkin's concept was not among the charges, he used his political contacts to convince nations such as Panama, Cuba, and India to sponsor a resolution on genocide to go before the General Assembly of the United Nations. He contributed to early drafts that included details of physical, biological, and cultural techniques of destruction. Sociologist Damien Short suggests that for Lemkin, these three categories were not separate types of genocide. Instead, they were interconnected techniques of group destruction. That is, you, they are often came in combination with one another. They were a composite form of crime. Uh, following Lemkin's lead, the Secretary Draft Convention used these terms in its 1947 draft, causing death of members of a group or injuring their health or physical integrity, uh, physical genocide, restricting births or biological genocide, and destroying the characteristics of the group. Now I'm gonna trouble this categorization of these three separate types a little later in the talk um, to suggest that we, we sometimes draw too sharp a distinction between the three. But I just wanna flag those for now and move on with this story of the formation of the United Nations Genocide Convention. Now, after the Secretariat draft, uh, the Ad Hoc Committee on Genocide also prepared a draft. And in this draft, they had kept Lemkin's article on cultural genocide. This was formerly Article 3 of the Genocide Convention, which read, and I'll just stick to the bolded portion here, in this convention, genocide also means any deliberate act committed with the intent to destroy the language, religion, or culture of a national, racial, or religious group on grounds of national or racial origins or religious beliefs. Um, you can go on to read the rest of it in the more specific acts he's including here, but you can get a sense about had this been included in genocide law, it would be a much more straightforward case of showing Canada's genocidal actions against indigenous peoples. Um, but as we'll see, Canada had a role in making sure that this article was removed from the Genocide Convention. So early on, even back to the Secretariat draft, um, Lemkin faced resistance from people who disagreed with the inclusion of cultural genocide. Lemkin countered their concerns, arguing, quote, a racial, national, or religious group cannot continue to exist unless it pres pre preserves its spirit and moral unity, 
If the diversity of cultures were destroyed, it would be as disastrous for civilization as the physical destruction of nations. You've got this Herderian romanticism again. But as well, right alongside that, you get Lemkin's pragmatism as he went about after saying this, reassuring nation states that they would not be accused of genocide for their efforts to integrate minorities into their countries noting the assimilation of minorities was acceptable when conducted through, in his terms, relatively moderate methods. So he's really trying to balance both his connection, his commitment to this idea of cultural genocide, while also trying to get all these powerful actors on side with his law. These arguments failed to appease his opponents. For some delegates, it was ridiculous to suggest genocide could occur through efforts to assimilate and erase what they perceived to be backward cultures. Um, pseudo-scientific evolutionary standards for assessing the value of groups and belief in the civilizational project were still very much in vogue while these discussions were going on. For example, we see here Mr. Petran from Sweden, who states his, his, um, his confusion about the inclusion of this article, and he even goes so far in the end of the statement to say the question could arise whether, for example, the fact that Sweden had converted the Laps or the, the Sami to Christianity might not lay her open to the accusation that she committed an act of cultural genocide. So bald face, he's really ready to stand forward and say, you know, we did this, um, I see no problem with it. How could this possibly be included in the Genocide Convention? Um, sorry, I'm moving a bit fast here. Uh, other delegates brought up the, the specter of cannibalism, saying, are we going to protect cannibalistic cultures? There was a, a very um, um, Eurocentric and problematic debate that took place among those engaged. Other delegates argued, A, that physical and cultural genocide were too different to combine under the same law. This is the, the qualitative difference argument that we often see. B, cultural genocide was covered by other legal protections and see that an article on cultural genocide was too vague to be of any legal utility, an argument we still hear sometimes as well. Mr. Federspiel of, from Denmark raised two of these objections in his remark, expressing his astonishment, quote, that the ad hoc committee should have submitted so vague a text. He continued, quote, it would show a lack of logic and a, a sense of proportion to include in the same convention both mass murders in gas chambers and the closing of libraries. In the end, 26 nations voted in favor of excluding cultural genocide from the United Nations Genocide Convention, 16 against, and there were four abstentions. So Article 3 was removed and we lost this piece of law. So what we wound up with in the United Nations Genocide Convention is Article 2 as being the primary definition of genocide, where you have the top part, which is the mens rea portion, the, the intent, the idea that you know genocide is um, means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. That's where the title of my talk comes from. And then you have the actus reus, the, the five different acts that constitute genocide. Now, convincing arguments have been presented for the application of Article 2 to settler colonialism in Canada, such as in the work of Tamara Starblanket, David MacDonald, and the, missing, the National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And I would recommend any of those texts if you wanna see how a legal argument could be made on this, using this, this law. But I wanna focus on some of the article's problems, which lead it to poorly represent indigenous experiences of genocide in my estimation, or also how it opens space for the doubters and deniers in some ways. So a few immediate points are worth making about this article. The groups protected under it are limited to national, ethnic, racial, and religious groups. These terms do not capture the holistic complexity of many indigenous societies. Destruction is also imagined in a manner that does not capture how indigenous identity is entangled with land and language. So these are crucial relationships to identity, to belonging, are not factored in except for in a very instrumental sense through Article 2C. Moreover, the notion of intent offered is so narrow, referring only to specific intent designed to eliminate a group for who they are, or as such, the as such in the chapeau in the top part is very important here. Um, thus providing uh, nations a defense when their group destructive actions can be presented as primarily driven by economic or expansionary desires. 
these are seen as another category of crime often, rather than uh, as necessarily falling under the United Nations Genocide Convention. But again, the sources I recommended earlier show that this is not necessarily the case, but this is how some people insist on interpreting the intent portion of the Genocide Convention. So Lemkin felt Article 2E, the one you're probably focused most on here, on the transfer of children from one group to another, preserves a form of cultural genocide in the, in the Genocide Convention. Some scholars agree and apply it to phenomena such as forced residential schooling, as you would see in David McDonald's or uh, Tamara Starblanket's work. However, others argue that 2E only reflects physical or biological genocide. That is, they say to qualify as genocide, children have to be removed from their homes in a manner that is permanent, thereby jeopardizing the group's biological and physical existence. Now, I'm not questioning at all the, per the permanence of the sort of removals that happened in Canada, but this is how the, the deck was stacked to try to provide nation, settler colonial nations like Canada who are worried about this, some flexibility in how they would interpret their actions. It's also worth noting that in implementing the, the Genocide Convention in the Canadian Criminal Code, Canada recognized only Articles 2A and 2C, further, further trying to place its, its actions beyond the reach of the law. So again, a lot of politics involved here. Canada was from the beginning very consistent in its view that the United Nations should prepare a more limited definition of genocide. It wasn't the only settler colonial nation to present this view, but certainly they were among that group working against the inclusion of cultural genocide. In his autobiography, Lemkin nonetheless represents the Canadian delegation as his allies. Though this may have been a strategic representation, uh, Lemkin's autobiography is sometimes questioned by historians for its, uh, its utility because he was often trying to use it as a lobbying tool. Um, uh, so <clears throat> lost my spot here for a second. Oh, there, I'm sorry. <laughs> During the July 1948 discussions in Geneva on a late night stroll, Lemkin recalls coming across Canadian amb Ambassador Dana Wilgress on a late night, and the two of them discussed the convention. So Lemkin writes, when I accompanied him back to his hotel, he told me it would be very good for us, and I distinctly heard the saving phrase for us to win the support of the future president of the Assembly in Paris. Paris. He was Wilgress's personal friend. Around the same time, however, this telegram was sent by the Secretary of State for External Affairs in Ottawa to the Canadian delegation in Geneva. It instructed, you should support or initiate any move for the deletion of Article 3 on cultural genocide. If this move is not successful, you should vote against Article 3 and if necessary, against the convention. The convention as a whole, less Article 3 is acceptable although legislation, legislation will naturally uh, be required to implement the convention. That last line about the legislature needed to implement the convention sort of flags for me this idea that Canada also sees some flexibility in how they're going to incorporate this into domestic law, because under the convention they know Canadian courts will likely be the courts of first resort for any genocide claim against Canada, so their national law would be the first to be tested. Then we get the statement um, from Mr. Lapointe from Canada as the debate on cultural genocide is reaching its, its, its final moments, where he writes, yet, or he says out loud, yet it was true to say that the government and the people of Canada were horrified at the idea of cultural genocide and hoped that effective action would be taken to suppress it. The people of Canada were deeply attached to their cultural heritage, which was made up mainly of a combination of Anglo-Saxon and French elements and they would strongly oppose any attempt to undermine the influence of those two cultures in Canada. So I probably don't need to mention this, but it's very striking here. The delegates simultaneous act of erasing the cultural heritage of indigenous peoples while claiming Canada's adherence um, and commitment to the protection of culture. So the reason in this section I'm focusing on the issue of cultural genocide and its elimination from the Genocide Convention is to try to show how colonial politics seeped into the drafting of genocide law. Not only were civilizational discourses present in the rationale for removing Article 3 on cultural genocide, settler colonial nations with a vested interest in preventing scrutiny of their treatment of indigenous peoples were able to impose their will on its ultimate content. <clears throat> 
So now I want to shift from looking at the role Canada had in shaping that genocide law to how the genocide term has been used in Canadian discussions of genocide. And, you know, the politics of genocide law have left many Canadians with a narrow understanding of what genocide is. And likewise, growing Holocaust consciousness, particularly through the 70s and 80s, especially regarding the death camps such as Auschwitz, produced a very restricted understanding of what it might mean to intend to destroy a group. I should note that genocide accusations against Canada were made between the creation of the Genocide Convention and our present moment. Indeed, one can see the application of the term as early as 1959. Um, there might be earlier examples. If you ever find earlier examples, uh, please feel free to send them to me. Um, but this is one I, I came across in, in the Indian record um, from uh, Gilbert Clarence Montour. Um, but the discussion has not really been sustained until recently. So we find uh, brief moments where genocide is used. It's probably used quite a bit among certain populations, um, amongst indig indigenous leaders. Um, um, there's a paper the author, Seth Adima, writes about how it was used in a lot of prison documents, uh, genocide. There was a whole genocide discussion going on in some of the prison literature that was being written by inmates. Um, so, but I'm going to identify what I see as some of the key moments in the genocide discussion in Canada. Um, certainly in the aftermath of the 1969 liberal white paper, Indigenous leaders either used the term or alluded to it in describing Canada's proposed policy that ignored Indigenous rights and title and promoted whole-scale assimilation. Uh, soon after that, uh, Davis and Zanis published their book, 1973, uh, called The Genocide Machine in Canada, where they make a case that Canada was committing genocide in the North through its commitment to development. But these published, um, these, these, these publications that confront the genocide question in Canada are a little bit few and far between. It's not till the 1990s again that we see an intensification of this, this discussion, as well as its application to the residential school system. The American Quincentennial celebrations were accompanied by books by David Stanner, 1992's American Holocaust, and later Ward Churchill, whose A Little Matter of Genocide came out in 1997. Canadian-specific texts also appeared, such as Daniel Paul's We Were Not the Savages, Agnes Grant's No End of Grief, and Roland Chris John's and Sherry Young's The Circle Game, and the second edition of Harold Cardinal's Unjust Society, which introduced the language of genocide to the text, also came out. In this, in this period. In several of these books, not all of them, but in several of them, the Holocaust is still the primary point of comparison used by the authors to demonstrate that genocide occurred in North America. And that even continues into the 2000s um, when Dean New and Richard Terrian in their book, Accounting for Genocide, also are trying to show that what happened in Canada is like the Holocaust. So that prototype continues to shape how we think about genocide in Canada. Now, you know, standing on the shoulders of all these, um, you know, wise people who, who came before me, it wasn't until 2009 that I started to write about this topic. I had a long um, period from my, my PhD dissertation to finally coming back to those discussions I'd had with the elders and leaders in British Columbia. And it was in 2009, I published a paper titled Ontological Destruction, where I worked to try not to use the Holocaust as the measure, but rather to understand genocide in Canada on its own terms. And to do so, my goal was to open up the notions of intent, destruction, and group, so that um, a broader variety of perspectives and cosmologies and understandings of what group life means could be included under that umbrella. So I tried to undo, undo some of the Euro Eurocentric framings that shaped our interpretation of these terms. I presented this paper at two different International Association of Genocide Scholars conferences, where I was the only presenter talking about Canada, and in fact, the only paper, only paper talking about North America. The key moment in a sustained genocide discussion, though, comes through the work, of course, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their decision to use the terminology of cultural genocide. But we got to remember that class action lawsuits laid the basis for the work of the TRC. There's lots of grassroots activism that made this, um, this commission possible. And the efforts of, and in general also more broadly, the efforts of indigenous 
drivers to convey the horrors of residential school had been happening for many, many years. We can also point to key publications from James Daschuk and Ian Mosby in 2013, increased Canadian, the increase in Canadian knowledge of violence and destructive neglect in settler colonialism. Then in 2014, here in Winnipeg, national attention was drawn to the question of whether the Canadian Museum for Human Rights would use genocide to describe Canada in its exhibits. So all of these things are priming the Canadian public for, for the TRC's intervention in a way. And you know, bringing, the, bringing the, the genocide concept more into the mainstream. And this was mainstreamed even further in the final week prior to the release of the TRC summary report when Supreme Court Justice, I'm gonna to move to this slide, Beverly McLaughlin spoke publicly of Canada's history of attempted cultural genocide. Likewise, former Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin referred to cultural genocide on the eve of the TRC report. So it was mainstreamed, but it was mainstreamed under the language of cultural genocide, which conveyed to many a secondary or lesser form of genocide which, you know, going back to the history of Lincoln's thinking about genocide, we see is not necessarily the case. Cultural is actually very central to how a group sustains itself and preserves itself over time. Um, David MacDonald explains the TRC had several strategic reasons for using cultural genocide instead of genocide, including the desire to avoid legalistic debate with detractors who might use the letter of the law to distract the public from the calls to action and the survivor testimony contained within the report. It's also important to note that the TRC mandate did not allow the commission to consider questions of law, so they did not see this as something they could deal with on a legal basis. The National Enquirer for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, however, were under no such limitation in preparing their report, and they used this freedom to produce one of the most interesting interventions to date, their genocide supplement. What I find most compelling in their genocide supplement is not just the sophisticated use of genocide law, but also how they demand more from the law, recognizing that genocide law needs to better grapple with gendered, aspect, gendered aspects of group destruction, as well as the fact that indigenous law has been marginalized in the discussions of genocide. I mean, they mentioned that, you know, no indigenous leaders were included in these discussions at the General Assembly about the law of genocide. No indigenous perspectives were, were, were included. And this is an important point to consider when we think about how um, you know, European Eurocentric law is made. Um, the discovery of unmarked graves and numerous residential schools has further sparked national discussion, bringing to light what survivors had long known that residential schools were places of cultural destruction, but also that lives were lost in these so-called schools to a deadly combination of violence, disease, and neglect. These recent reports have inspired challenges from some quarters of Canadian scholarship, including the small group that, is galvanized, that was galvanized by the Canadian Historical Association's Canada Day Statement. Some participants in the current debate, such as J.R. Miller, suggest, suggest that there is a widely accepted definition of genocide in the form of the Genocide Convention, and that this should serve as our guide. They also fixate on the Holocaust as the genocide prototype, rather than recognizing diverse forms of group destruction. These are classic gatekeeper moves. However, as I've sought to communicate today, we must be careful not to treat genocide law as though it is static, and lacking a history of its own. We have to interrogate the contingencies of law's creation, such as the inclusions and exclusions that go into its development. But we also must acknowledge that law is fluid and new interpretations continue to be brought into the convention, such as in the Akiesu case at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where the court noted that the specification of ethnic, racial, religious, and national groups is too limiting. They opted to read the convention as simply speaking to persistent and subjectively perceived collectives, that is people see themselves as a part of the group, giving a more active sense of what a group is than the ascribed categories of nation, race, ethnicity, and religion allow. So through such interpretations, genocide law is always, you know, it may be a slow movement, but it is making some movements. And we see more and more in courts also judges saying, hey, we can't ignore culture. Culture is actually really an important part of what this group is and how the members relate to one another, how they understand each other, how they speak to each other, how they orient themselves to their world. We can't simply leave this aside. Another point worth making, and one that Sean Carlton and I cover in our article, is that detractors often proceed as though the question of Canadian genocide, or sorry, as though the question is one of Canadian genocide or innocence. 
But in my field, the debate on Canada, the question is usually one of should it be called genocide or crimes against humanity, which are two very serious charges. Uh, I fall in the genocide camp, but some scholars um, like McGill Law Professor Payam Akhtavan would suggest crime against humanity is a more fitting designation. Akhtavan, I'll give you a slide for Akhtavan here, argues that usage of genocide and cultural genocide in particular to describe Canadian residential schools is, in his words, quote, a mourning metaphor. I'm getting an unstable connection. Is everyone able to hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, I didn't want to lose this point. Um, so he calls this a mourning metaphor. He says the problem with the term cultural genocide, as he sees it, is that it has no legal meaning. Genocide law, as posited and interpreted, does not provide recourse for claims of cultural destruction in his interpretation. According to this argument, even Section 2E of the Convention is an imperfect mechanism for achieving justice for residential schools because there is little jurisprudence testing its application. In addition, Akavan questions whether the required dolus specialis or specific intent exists in the case of residential schools. Given that the transfer of children was in his view carried out to transform indigenous cultural practices, not to eliminate them as groups. And here you see that sort of restrictive reading that allows doubters to bring in these sorts of concerns that I mentioned earlier in respect to article two of the Genesis Convention. He's suggesting that the intent wasn't one inspired by a desire to destroy peoples as such for who they are, it was you know, to transform them. Now, Akhavan's not an expert on in in settler, settler colonial and indigenous history in Canada. And um, I would not I'm not trying to represent his perspective here as authoritative because I think you know, better arguments have been made by the genocide supplement of the master, the missing, um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry that I meant, as I discussed earlier. But Akhavan's perspective has had some purchase with the group of detractors, and they often rely on his articles to try to um, boost up their perspective as they try to counter the Canadian Historical Association's arguments. So here you can see Akhavan writing, in the case of biological destruction, children are permanently separated from a group with the intention to destroy the group's capacity to physically reproduce itself. In the case of cultural destruction, however, children are separated from a group temporarily or for a prolonged period with the intention to destroy the group's culture, cultural identity rather than reproductive capacity. And he says this is the case for residential schools. So he clearly hasn't dug too deeply in the residential school policy record. Um, the objective of assimilating indigenous peoples was underwritten by a deeper concern with the so-called quote unquote Indian problem, which presented indigenous peoples as obstacles to land acquisition and the consolidation of the nation. Cultural change was understood, you know, the attempt to force cultural change was understood as a means to group elimination with the goal that indigenous peoples would be in Davin's words, merged and lost within Canadian society and therefore no longer a threat or impediment. And what's interesting about Akhavan is in some ways he, he, he tries to show himself as you know, on side. He, he says, you know, um, he recognizes, for example, that there are indigenous uh, legal orders that are out in Canada and that they have, there are different legal interpretations that come from indigenous communities. And he also recognizes that you know, indigenous relationships with land are, are very important in their sense of, of belonging, their sense of groupness. But this doesn't factor into his analysis. Instead, what it leads him to is a, a very dismissive and, and, and paternalistic conclusion that survivors are less concerned with legal taxonomy than they are with marking and naming their feelings of loss. And he refers to this as a song of bereavement. And this is something some of the detractors in the open letter repeat, uh, not in the open letter, but in their subsequent writings. So I'm gonna try to close up here because I'm, I'm, I'm in danger of going too long. Um, but what I wanna point to is there's problems of colonial law and Akhavan and people who follow his perspective are missing this. 
And they're also missing an opportunity to rethink genocide law through an indigenous inclusive legal pluralism. For example, the rigid separation in genocide law between the physical, biological, and cultural, which I flagged earlier, is often allowed to stand in these analysis as though these are all discrete categories. But of course, you know, if a lake like Lake Winnipeg nearby me is allowed to be, you know, to, to toxify, this is not just an instance of physical destruction or biological destruction, although it does in fact impact people's lives and their abilities to reproduce. It's also a matter of cultural destruction. These things are all entwined and entangled in complex ways. And that's why I like Ted's statement here from the preface for colonial genocide in indigenous North America, when he refers to that complex tangle of political, social, cultural, economic, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual harms. This is what we see in Lemkin's initial writings on genocide that becomes um, you know, hacked away at through political negotiations, through the efforts of um, nations to preserve their own innocence or their own perceptions of innocence. So as I said, Akhavan is favorably cited by people like Christopher Dummett and P. Whitney Lackenbauer in some of their interventions in opposition to the Canadian Historical, Historical Association Canada Day Statement. In particular, they are drawn to this language of describing cultural genocide as a mourning metaphor and song of bereavement, which I find um, just awful. Um, they tap into Akhavan's ethnocentrism, treating indigenous understandings of their collective life and its potential for destruction as mystical and romantic, rather than founded on legal traditions, um, both Western and indigenous, you know, rather than, you know, listening, you know, to elders, listening to survivors, and the ways in which they themselves articulate their experiences of destruction. So what happens is we get this top-down method of always trying to apply and impose genocide law rather than a more bottom-up method that seeks to understand where people are coming from and how these experiences affect their experience of being a group. So I'm gonna conclude here. Um, in this presentation, my goal was to contextualize the Canadian Historical Association's genocide statement and its detractors in a broader history of the genocide concept particularly its cultural and political origins. In so doing, I've drawn upon the tools of critical genocide studies to help us move past a rote adjudication of genocide and instead toward constructive critique of the notion, pointing to some of its blind spots and limitations. While I retain the language of genocide as it applies to Canada, and I stand by that term, I also ask the concept to do more that, it, that that is to grapple better with what it means to destroy a group with intent in diverse political and cultural contexts. So thank you. I hope uh, my internet didn't break up too much. Um, I really appreciate you all listening to me and inviting me here today. And I'm eager to hear questions. Let's go to thank you so much, Dr. Wolford. That was was challenging and powerful and so important uh, for all of us here and more broadly across northern North America at this moment in time. So thank you for pushing us to think about these questions. Um, I'm Shannon Stendenbauer. I'm a professor in the Department of History, Classics and Religion. I'll be sort of uh, managing the Q&A along with my colleague, uh, Professor Crystal Fraser, also in the Department of History, Classics and Religion, and also in the Faculty of Native Studies here at the University of Alberta. So we're the Q&A hosts. Um, please, at this point, uh, feel free to input your questions using the Q&A box that is available to you. These questions will be visible to uh, Crystal and I at the back end here, and we will be articulating them uh, to Dr. Wolford as appropriate. We may need to you know, combine questions, uh, connect them as appropriate, to see how things go, but we will certainly be basing our engagements with Dr. Wolford on the signals we get from the audience. So please access that Q&A and we will build on uh, the input we get from you. I also uh, noted in the chat uh, as the presentation was going on and everybody was recognizing the importance and significance of what was before us today, uh, there were questions about how to access the recording of this talk. The recording will be available on the Faculty of Arts the University of Alberta YouTube channel that's publicly accessible, and it should be available 
from about mid-December onward. And uh, Dr. Dunch has put that link in the chat for everyone. So please copy that, store it for later, and this talk will be accessible there before too long. Uh, so lucky me, uh, as the first person to talk in the q and I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the first question. And I think, Andrew, I'd, I was really struck uh, by the attention you paid to the really important national inquiry uh, on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And, and particularly, I was interested on in the spotlight that uh, really important uh, document and process puts on the importance of gendered. Uh, um, analyses and, of colonialism and uh, genocide and gendered thinking through those concepts. And I, I wonder if I could ask you to elaborate on the significance of gender in, in at that intersection. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, I'm so unmuted. Um, it's, it's really important. I mean, I'm gonna go back too far, but genocide studies is a very male heavy um, field. A lot of the participants in the field look exactly like me. And, and um, Jen has been largely a small group of scholars. And, you know, I think um, one thing that Indigenous scholars and Indigenous feminist scholars have brought to the discussion is more attention to um, gendered violence and gender destruction that includes, you know, um, violence against women, but also goes beyond that and sort of understands the ways in which, for example, um, women's roles as knowledge keepers or, uh, you know, uh, might be, are affected by settler colonialism and the different ways in which um, not just physically settler colonialism um, impacts upon, you know, one's gendered existence, but also in, in a very, you know, you know, again, these are entangled ways in which, you know, um, destruction of the land has an impact on gendered relations within a community and um, removal of land also, um, you know, um, <clears throat> I always think of my, my research in, in, um, in the United States where I've also done some work on boarding schools there and some of the work on, you know, Navajo and, um, you know, the, the Diné people. And um, you know the way in which the culling of sheep affected um, you know communal relations within the Diné and within the Hogan. So um, you know there's many great examples out there about how broadly gendered these destructive processes are. And the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in National Inquiry really targets this and, and shows that you know um, that what is happening to Indigenous women in Canada, um, you know, fits into a larger picture of settler colonial genocide in a very important and significant way. Thank you. Yeah, it's so significant to have that document and, and, and um, frameworks before us to, to work with as we, we do the work collectively of, of trying to think better about these things. Uh, Dr. Fraser, would you like to put the next question or take over at this point in any event. Mm -hmm. Dringuinzi, um, thank you for everything, Dr. Wolford. This has been incredible. Um, I am on rural internet, so I, I hope the video and the sound is aligning. Um, I had the immense pleasure of, of listening to your lecture in Dr. Crystal Raven's class on, on Monday. Um, and so I have more information here than the audience does, um, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this book, um, Did You See Us? And, and in particular, you know, how, how communities are grappling with this term of genocide, of, of what you're seeing on the ground, of, of how maybe not everyone is, is using that terminology, but recognizing its importance. Um, I've, to be transparent, I've also been asked to review this book. So um, any, <laughs> any bones you can throw me is perfect. Oh gosh, yeah, now my, now I gotta try to promote it. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's really been an important journey and one I'm still um, learning a lot on. <clears throat> 
as I moved from, um, as an introvert, I love archival research. I enjoy uh, burying myself in the documents, but forcing myself to come out of my shell um, or, you know, Ted Fontaine in some ways dragging me out of my uh, shell and involving me in these projects has been, you know, very uh, eye-opening. And, and one of the things I always want to do is try to, avoid any form of it, like epistemic violence of it, imposing my interpretations on others and on their experiences. That That is one of the reasons why um, did you see us, the, the chapters in there um, that are written by the survivors of the Assiniboia Residential School, um, you know, they aren't based on any interview questions. They're just, you know, been asked to speak and tell us what they are willing to share about their school with the audience. And then we did virtually no editing. So if one chapter contradicted the other, we allowed that, those tensions to stand and um, to, to remain because there were different memories of how of the school. And some people wanted to focus more on the positive aspects of the school and some wanted to focus more on, um, and when I say positive, I don't really like this juxtaposition of positive um, versus negative because I, uh, I, I don't expect people have read some of my broader background work on, on uh, colonial genocide through residential schools. But um, as I link this to a history whereby, you know, one of the goals was to try to entice children away from their families and their communities, positive, so-called positive treatment in a residential school doesn't necessarily mean positive treatment. Positive can be also used towards the purposes of group destruction. Um, so that's, sorry for that um, segue, but, um, the, you know, the survivors, you know, tell their stories if they want to focus on, you know, on hockey or on, uh, you know, friendships and the family-like uh, relationships they built with their fellow students. And that was what they, they, they focused on. And, um, you know, uh, Ted did some work to try to contextualize that, to mention the schools that many of them had come from and how violent those schools were and how the relatively better conditions they experienced at Assiniboia were really experienced in contrast to the, the hell they had been through at their previous schools. And so, um, you know, again, it's Ted's voice that leads us through that kind of interpretation rather than the professor coming in and, and trying to, you know, claim authority over the real experts who are the people who, who lived and, and experienced the school. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind me saying, um, I, I also came like through this experience in my research that um, that survivors, intergenerational survivors, don't necessarily always want to focus on, on the genocidal aspect, on the negative aspect, and, and following the work of, you know, education Indigenous scholar um, Eve Tuck, you know, calling for this moratorium on, on damage-centered research. Um, on no longer thinking of ourselves as as broken nations that we can go forward with with a different kind of narrative I think um, is is important for the continuity of of our communities yeah so thank you thank you for that um, Dr. Student Bauer for sure um, we've got a, a nice selection of questions from the audience right now so I'm going to put one of them uh, Dr. Wilford and this is from audience member Cadence Redding. Um, they write, uh, you mentioned early on that you were interested in doing work in reconciliation prior, prior to starting research in genocide studies. I'm curious what you think the most important role of your research in genocide studies plays in the ongoing efforts of reconciliation in Canada, if any. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think when I came up against that question in um, my book, This Gen this uh, benevolent experiment, which you know is, is a quote, I wasn't calling it a benevolent experiment. Uh, just to be clear about that title, sometimes it gets confused. Um, but when I came to the end, I had a very critical perspective on the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, trying to look at some of the, the, the weaknesses, some of the ways in which the state was using this as a tool of governance to try to contain what it perceived as still, you know, quote unquote, the Indian problem that it still seemed to be working within this framework in some respects. Um, so in some ways that just became also big for me that um, my engagement with reconciliation went far more local. And that's why I moved to community-based research um, for a period. 
uh, particularly working with the Assiniboia Residential School group, as well as with a group of survivors on a, a virtual reality uh, rendering of the Fort Alexander Indian Residential School as a sort of um, thing that they could leave for the, their grandchildren to sort of engage with and see not the, you know, they didn't want to expose them to the, 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 the harshest violence they experienced in that school, but to have them have a sense of the space because the, the school itself had been uh, torn down by the community because they no longer want to see this, the, the, this building that was the source of so much trauma in their, their community. Um, so yeah, those local relationships became a way to sort of do uh, everyday reconciliation and to, you know, really connect with survivors. So um, Theodore Fontaine is just, you know, someone who opens those kind of doors for people. Um, but I learned so much from other elders like uh, uh, Mary Crushane and um, uh, Betty Ross and other people who are, you know, been on, on, on these projects with me who, you know, keep, you know, grounding it in, you know, the, in, um, in, in the everyday world and, you know, directing it in a good way and focusing on those positive things that we can do to make a difference in people's, you know, immediate lives rather than, you know, me going off and writing grand schemes about what reparations or what reconciliation might look like. Every day on the ground reconciliation. I think that's a powerful idea. Uh, Dr. Fraser, you have the next question. I do, um, and this one is from Dr. Uh, Crystal Raven, who you met on Monday. Um, she writes, you mentioned how discussions of Canada and indigenous peoples go into a dichotomy of crimes against humanity versus genocide. Can you expand a bit more about that and why you see genocide as more accurate? Yeah. I'll, I'll explain the opposing view first so that my perspective is clear. Um, so those like um, Akaban who prefer crimes against humanity, largely it comes down to the very, um, what they see as the very strict uh, specific intent requirements of the Genocide Convention. So they feel that Canada does not, you know, um, show the sort of intent to destroy indigenous peoples as such. Now, I, I don't agree with that argument, and, um, but that's not really my major source of disagreement. And it, is a, it is a major source of disagreement, but not the major, the, the, the most major. Um, what I don't like about just crimes against humanity is it loses this notion of the destruction of groups. And as a sociologist, the life of groups is very important to me. I'm interested in how people um, experience, you know, a sense of value from their involvement in groups. Now groups are not always valuable. Groups can be oppressive, groups can be um, problematic, but for many people, group life can be a source of identity, a source of belonging, a way in which to position themselves in a complex and challenging world. It's a store of information, of cultural knowledge that they can take out with them and see the world through. Um, so groups I think play an important role. And I think if we simply call it crimes against humanity, um, you know, crimes against humanity speaks to a more sort of individualized sort of crime that individuals are being killed by the state or being harmed or being, you know, subject to sexual violence or, you know, all of the very many, the very various crimes that are listed under a crime against humanity. Um, but it doesn't get at that collective, the collective nature of the harm. Thank you. I'm going to offer the next question from an audience member. This one comes from Kristen Burton. And the question is as follows. I am curious how the debates occurring in Canada are affecting those beyond national borders. For example, the US Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, called the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative an investigation into federal boarding school policies back in June, a response to the discovery of the 215 unmarked graves of a Kamloops Indian residential school. So the question, in what ways are these debates connected to or influencing those occurring in the US or elsewhere? Yeah, I think, um, you know, quite a, quite a bit from what I'm seeing from an anecdotal perspective, you know, going around the, the networks of which I'm a part in, in genocide studies, I've been invited to speak to several uh, groups in the US about Canada and to talk a little bit about, you know, some of what's being proposed in terms of truth and reconciliation in the United States. 
And what's interesting is they look enviously at Canada and think that we are so far ahead. And in many ways, in many ways, you know, we are, although those of us who are on the ground here also see, you know, limitations and problems with how, how things are going and, you know, a continuation of, you know, encroachment on indigenous territory or um, uh, dispossession of indigenous territory and all the other things that, you know, um, fill our concerns on a day-to-day -day basis. So sometimes the, you know, um, the job is one of kind of talking my American friends down a little bit, but at the same time, it's so nice for that they're actually interested about Canada because I, you know, I used to go to conferences, you know, the, the big sociology conferences and I get, you know, put away on the Canada panel which no one went to, it was just the six Canadians who were at that conference who would attend our own panel and no one cared. So, um, so I shouldn't be too good, but you know, um, you know, Americans are suddenly, you know, taking an interest in what's happening in Canada and seeing parallels, which is also really important because depending upon where someone is in the United States, it seems it's been a long journey to recognize indigeneity in all regions you know so there's some regions where there's a strong indigenous presence where uh, you know there's always been you know some sense of relation with indigenous communities but there's others where you know um, people don't seem to know that there were indigenous peoples in parts of New England or uh, you know in other parts of the world and even when I go to those universities now you do see land acknowledgments and more grappling with you know uh, whose land it was that the campus was located on and you know steps like that. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I mean, I think we'll take one final question. Um, and it comes from an anonymous attendee. And apologies, it's quite um, a lengthy question that that I, I did not have time to compress. Um, so I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, so Dr. Wolford touched upon the complicated originary politics of the genocide con concept and the genocide convention, as well as Lemkin's own complex role in this, because many of the contemporary genocide debates seem to revolve around what did Lemkin really intend. I recall Alex Laban Hinton once saying, on some level, we need to go beyond this sort of Lemkin originalism that seeks to wage contemporary debates through interpretations of Lemkin. For those of us interested in critical genocide studies, I'm wondering how Dr. Wolford would describe what the contemporary relationship to Lemkin should be, or alternatively, how he would describe his relationship to Lemkin. Yeah, that's... Um... That's a good question, you know, because we all start out in genocide studies as something, you know, kind of Lemkin fanboys, and then that <laughs> begins to shift as we, we learn more and more of the complexity of the individual. Um, and so, you know, Alex is a good colleague of mine, and, you know, someone who I co-author co with a lot in critical genocide studies types of writing. So I, I strongly share his perspective that we have to get rid of this Lemkin fundamentalism because, you know, um, this sort of aggrandizement and, you know, making a hero out of the founder leads us into a bind where his own limitations, his own blind spots are not being addressed. And, you know, you see this in particular in those later writings of his where he becomes more set on genocide as involving annihilation. So, but, you know, for me, I, I, I'm always worried about, you know, um, babies in bathwater um, that, uh, you know, Dirk Moses, who is also someone I work with and whose work, I, you know, I think is just fabulous. If you haven't read his new book, it's really a, a tour de force in many ways. But he also, you know, is one of these people who just wants to dispose of the genocide concept altogether. Um, that, you know, it's too tainted by not just Lemkin's legacy, but its politicization. Um, whereas I'm like, well, I still see it as being, you know, a useful concept, the idea of the destruction of a type, the destruction of a group as a form of harm, um, as important to hang on to. So to that extent, I preserve some of that. And I'm still curious about some of Lemkin's original thinking um, as it comes out in 
um, access rule and some of his, his um, unpublished writings on world genocides and the ways in which, you know, he does have this sort of capacious notion that he's, he's an amateur sociologist, he's an amateur anthropologist, he's an amateur anything, and he's trying to combine all these literatures in, a, in an interesting way to understand the ways that groups destroy. And eventually he just settles on, well, let's just focus on, you know, how they get killed. But, you know, before that, there's some real depth and, and, and curiosity in his work that I don't wanna necessarily just throw out. Although um, as a field, we have to simply stop, you know, treating Lemkin as the Bible or as whatever religious text. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and this really wraps up our, our Q&A period. And I just wanna say uh, hi Cho um, from, from my Gwichi Gwichin, Dinji Zhu family. Um, I'm feeling really blessed to be a part of this whole process. Um, and, and as a scholar, well, and really an intergenerational survivor of Indian residential schools, I, I really appreciate your, your words and, and your research. And I'm also thankful to Elder Gilman for, for joining us. Um, and, and there is actually more to come. And, and so Dr. Wolford has been so generous in his time that, you know, on Monday, um, he gave a guest lecture to Dr. Crystal Raven's class. Um, tomorrow, he is doing an interview with uh, two MA students that that will be posted and then published on on active history. Um, so so just really thank you so much. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Student Bauer and then Dr. Dunch for final comments. I don't really have too much to add beyond echoing uh, uh, Crystal's gratitude and appreciation for everybody who's participated today. Uh, and Dr. Wolford for your generosity, uh, your powerful ideas uh, and, and your commitment to the importance of scholarship in addressing these uh, big issues and big challenges. So thank you. Dr. Dunch. Thanks. And uh, thanks, Dr. Wolford. You know, one of the, the privileges of being an academic is that we never stop learning. I, I'm an Australian and a scholar of China and chair of a history department in Canada at this moment. And there's just so much to learn and so many uh, resonances of this talk with each part of my identity and my 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 uh, scholarly work as well. Uh, so uh, my only task really is to thank everyone, and I'm going to start, of course, with thanking Elder Gilman Cardinal. Thank you so much, sir, for for attending and giving the blessing, uh, Dr. Florence Glenfield the uh, Vice Provost of Indigenous Programming and Research. Thank you, Florence, for attending. Dr. Shannon Stundenbauer, my, my colleague, uh, Director of the History Section in our department and uh, a wonderful colleague to work with. Thank you for your work. And Dr. Crystal Raven, uh, also a colleague in the Department of History and in, uh, as well as the Faculty of Native Studies. Thank you for your organizational work. Uh, and the, uh, Shannon and Crystal have asked me to extend thanks also to their colleagues uh, among the historians of, of Canada and Indigenous North America uh, in our department who suggested Andrew and worked to uh, create the, uh, the event. Uh, thanks to Dr. Crystal Raven who hosted Andrew in class this week. Uh, the two MA students who've been named already, who will interview him, they'll have the pleasure and uh, pleasure of, of interviewing you, uh, Chris Chang and Phillips and Dylan Hall, and they've also been doing work behind the scenes as well. And thank you to our, our much, uh, much uh, loved and respected colleagues in the Arts Research Resource Center, uh, Grant Wong and Claire Peters, who are really such a a hope to the Faculty of Arts for events like this. Thank you also to all of you, our audience for tonight's talk, and of course, to our speaker, Dr. Andrew Wolford. Thank you very much. And that concludes our event for tonight, I think.
Go well. Bye-bye.